<sighs> All right, let me make sure this is recording as usual. Okay, good. Okay, so this section is on quadratic functions. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use all of the, the knowledge that we've gained about functions themselves so far, as well as some basic algebra skill. And we're going to look at how to graph a very particular class of functions. Right? And so um, for us, a quadratic function can be put into this form. We have a constant times a linear expression squared, and the coefficient of x is 1, plus k where a, h, and k are real numbers, and a, of course, is not zero. If a were zero, you wouldn't have a quadratic term. It'd just be a constant. All right, so you've seen quadratics before when we solved quadratic equations, right? So you looked at it, but there we said the general form was ax squared plus bx plus c. That's still the case, um, and we want to be able to graph functions like that, but they won't, it's not as easy to graph if they're in that form, but it is much, much simpler, as we'll see, to graph them if they're already in what we're going to call vertex form. So we're going to stri we're going to look at what these guys look like first and then later on when it when we look at a more general quadratic function we'll ask how can we put it into that form and then we'll be able to graph it. All right so to begin the discussion let's look at y equals x squared. All right so that's this uh, so this function the input basically is going to be squared. And so if you don't know how to graph a function to begin with, the most natural place to start is by plotting some points. And so what I do over here is I look at just a table of, of values. There's some semblance of pattern in that I'm including zero and that I'm going uh, the same direction on either side of zero each time. Um, those are all in the domain, right? There's no number that you can't square. So the domain's all reals. And so these are all viable numbers. If you square each one of these, you get these outputs over here. And so if you plot the order pairs that correspond to the rows of the table, you get these five points that I have here. Now you'll say, well, how do you know how to connect them? Well, this is a crude sampling, right? I mean, you'd have to technically choose more points in between, but every time you did that, you'd get more and more points that would tell you exactly what the shape looked like. And so you would eventually find that you do get this U shape. Right, so it does actually take a little bit more doing, but I'm more or less cutting to the chase. Um, we call a U-shaped graph like this a parabola. And a couple things to note is that this time, the minimum, it doesn't go down to infinity. It, the minimum is right here. This is the smallest the functional value ever gets because if you square zero, you get zero. And then any other number that you square, you're gonna get something that's bigger than zero. And so we call that a local min or the vertex. Also notice that if you go the same distance on either side of the y-axis, you get a point at the same height, right? And so we call that function even, right? It's symmetric about the y-axis. All right, um, so now we have that is now part of our arsenal. You can use the graph of x squared if it comes up. You don't have to reinvent the wheel with the tables. But now remember, we want to eventually graph functions like this. Right here, we assume that a was one and h and k were both zero, but what if they're not? And so what we want to do is step by step show how to introduce these a, h, and k's so that we can get more uh, gra graphs of more general quadratics. The first one I want to look at is multiplying it by a positive constant that's larger than one, right, two and four. Right, so if you look at 2x squared, I'm going to use exactly the same inputs and these are the new outputs, right? So I'm plugging these x values in here. And I have the old x squared graph up here for comparison's sake, right? And so what you'll notice is the vertex is the same. It's still symmetric about the y-axis. But this time, since I'm multiplying by 2, a, large, a number larger than 1, the outputs are getting larger quicker. And so it squeezes in or compresses towards the y-axis. If you multiply by four, like we do here, the same exact thing happens more dramatically, in fact, if you compare it to the original x squared. Right now, the outputs are quadrupled with respect to the original f, and so it's compressed even more towards the y-axis. So what you can say is that if you multiply x squared by a number larger than one, so two, four, any, any number larger than one, 
it compresses the graph towards the y-axis or makes it skinnier, if you want to think of it that way, by that factor. All right. Now, what if the number I'm multiplying by is between 0 and 1? Well, you can multiply by a half or a fourth. This time, the output is a half of the first one or a fourth of the first one. So they're smaller. Right? And so if here's the graph of the original f, right, the original x squared, the graph of this guy is going to be closer to the y-axis. It becomes fatter. And same way here, the f2 becomes even fatter yet. All right. So multiplying by a number between 0 and 1 makes the graph wider. It, it, it stretches it towards the x-axis, or flattens it, I should say, towards the x-axis. All right, what if we multiply by a negative number, right? So let's compare x squared to negative x squared. So side-by-side -side table, all we're doing is changing the sign of the output, right? I'm still squaring the inputs, but I'm changing their sign. Notice here, while everything was positive except for at zero, here, everything is now negative except for at zero, but it's the same distance from the opposites, from the x-axis. Right, and so what we're essentially doing is getting a reflection of x squared over the x-axis. Right, so multiplying x squared by negative one flips it over the x-axis. Well, what if I had multiplied two x squared by negative one? Well, if I made side-by-side -side tables of those, you would see that basically all I'm doing is using the same table as 2x squared, but now I'm multiplying all those outputs by negative 1. So it's going to be the same graph, but now upside down, flipped over the x-axis. Okay, doke. So basically multiplying by a negative reflects over the x-axis. Multiplying by a number that's larger than 1 makes it skinnier towards the y-axis and multiplying by a number between zero and one widens it. Okay, next one. What if I add a positive number to x squared? Right, so if I, here's my x, those are the input same ones. I graph x squared on the graph at the same time, but now if I'm adding one to it, I'm gonna increase the outputs by one compared to what they were, and so that's gonna eventually shift everything up one unit because right, you're always adding one to the output. The output's the y value of a point on that graph. If you're adding one every time, it's going to shift that graph up, up by one unit. Same way here, if I add four to all the outputs, I'm going to shift it up four units. Right. So you can kind of guess what's going to happen if I subtract one or four. Right? I'm going to diminish the output by one, so it's going to come down by one unit. If I'm subtracting four, I'm gonna move it down by four units. Okay, so what adding a number outside, right? So I'm adding, I'm doing the x squared and then I'm adding one to it, or I'm taking x squared and I'm subtracting something from it, that's gonna move it vertically up or down. Okay, that's what the k does. If you think back to our original form, that's what this k is gonna do. This a value, if it's negative, Right, it's gonna flip over the x-axis so the parabola will open down. If it's positive, it opens up. And if it's larger than or be one or between zero and one, it has that squeezing and compressing factor. The only thing we haven't yet talked about is what this h does, right? And so let's look at the effect of subtracting or adding a number inside the square first. All right, so again, same exact x values. And then what I'm doing here is the order is different. Right, I'm going to subtract one from the input first, and then I'm going to square that. And so if I do that, you could actually check that these are the points you get. Um, and if you compare it to the original x squared, right, you can check point for point that it's going to slide over to the right. All right. If you add one to the input, you can check that it slides it over to the left. Just If you don't believe me, actually plot the points and you'll see that that actually is the case. Okay. All right, and so we have that observation, right? So I'm, all I hear is I'm talking about the vertex. So if I just look at this, um, the easy way to tell if it's moving right or left is to see where the vertex moved, right? So see what, what x value makes this guy equal to zero, plug it in, and that's the location of the vertex 
And so wherever it is, that'll tell you which direction you had to move to get that. All right. The line, the, um, the line through the vertex. All right, so if I take, if you look here, the line x equals minus one goes through the vertex, that vertical line. Here, the line x, uh, negative one rather. And here, x equals one, that vertical line goes through the vertex. The parabola is symmetric about that vertical line in the exact same way that x squared was symmetric about the y-axis, right? And so what we'll say more generally is that the parabola uh, given by the graph of this guy, the vertex here occurs when x is h because that's what makes that guy zero. The, the line x equals h is the axis of symmetry. It's the vertical line around which you can bend the graph of that parabola and get exactly the same thing on both sides. And then the vertex will be hk, okay, because we had moved it up or down by that amount. All right, so let's actually, let's pull all this together and see if we can graph a function that looks like this. Okay, so what you want to think of, we're not going to plot points here, right, that will be reinventing the wheel. What we're going to do instead is use the previous observations about translating left or right, up or down, and compressing, stretching, and flipping to be able to just start with x squared and move that graph around to get the graph of big F. All right, so let's start with x squared. The first thing that we're going to do <coughs> by the order of operations is talk about what this guy looks like, right? We know that if you add something inside, we're gonna move the graph of x squared to the left that amount. And so the first thing, the first graph that we get is obtained by moving this guy to the left four units. This parabola here is y equals x plus four quantity squared. All right, and then once we're here, what do we do? We wanna subtract three from it, right, to get our graph of f. But subtracting three from a function is going to move it down vertically. And so this guy moves down vertically three units. All points move three units down. So I'm just tracking the vertex here each time, but every one of those points on the graph will then in fact move down three units. The graph is a little bad in terms of uh, just art, but that's what's really happening. All right, and so what we can see the graph still opens up, right? It didn't, it didn't open downward because I never multiplied out here by a negative number. It's the same width of x squared didn't compress or stretch because there's no number aside from one out here. And the vertex is this point. It's negative four comma negative three, right? And so a couple things we know, the domain, the domain of all quadratics is gonna be all reals, right? There's no number you can't put in and get a square or whatnot out, right? So they're always gonna be defined. The range, however, always extends from the vertex either up or down depending on what the parabola is doing. And so here, since it's opening upward, the lowest value in the range, the lowest y value attained is minus three and it opens up. And so the range is closed minus three to infinity. And then the axis of symmetry, the line that goes through the vertex, the vertical line that goes through the vertex is x equals minus four. All right, this one looks very similar, right? In fact, the only thing I've done differently is now multiply that x plus four squared by a negative one. And so let's just track through the, the pictures here. First thing I'm gonna do is take the x plus four squared, that should be a square here, it's a typo. So I simply move it over four units to the left. Now, what I have to do by the order of operations is multiply by negative one. You do not move it down first and then flip. Rather, what you do is you, by order of operations, what you would have to do for a particular x value is you'd have to multiply this output by negative one, and then you would subtract three. Okay, so if I multiply by negative one, that flips the graph over the x-axis, and then, then subtracting three from this moves it down three units, okay? Notice here the same axis of symmetry works, right? Because I haven't moved the parabola left or right from, four, from negative four, right? And so the vertex is still minus four minus three, but now the range is gonna go from minus three down to minus infinity, right? Because I'm opening downward. All right. 
go ahead and try this your turn one, right? So just try to verbally explain what the, um, the, how you attain the graphs of each one of these from the graph of x squared and then graph it in each case. See, so do that, pause the video and see what you get. Okay, so for the first one, remember you're gonna start here at x squared. I'm gonna move it right four and then up one. And so the graph, it's a little bit hard to see what the, the scale as it is, but the vertex is at four comma one. The axis of symmetry is the vertical line through that point, so it's x equals four and it opens up because I never multiplied the square term by a negative one. Right. For this guy, the fact that I put the minus three first is irrelevant. Um, don't get stuck on that. I can put the minus three at the end if you want. So this is equivalent to writing minus x squared minus three. Right. And so the first thing you're gonna do is reflect over the x-axis, right? because I have that negative in front of the x squared, and then since I'm subtracting three, I'm gonna move it down three. So this vertex is at zero, negative three, and then the range goes from minus three down to infinity. Okay. All right, and then finally, what if I have a general quadratic, right? So if, I, if the function's already in the vertex form, I can use those translation and reflection results to graph it, no problem. But they're not always gonna be in that form. Right, and so what we have to do is transform this guy into this one by some algebraic method, and that method is called completing the square. All right, so we're going to look at this uh, in a couple of uh, a couple of examples. All right, so the first one here is this guy. We're going to start off with an example where the coefficient of x squared is is one. Right, that's the easier of the two examples. All right, what we want to do is focus only on the square term and the linear term together, right? We just, we, we don't throw out the constant term, but we don't really concern ourselves with it at the beginning. Just so just leave it to the side. What we want to do is somehow fi find out what number I can add inside these parentheses here so that the resulting trinomial can be factored as something squared, all right? And so that number, there's a way of proving this result, um, but Short of that, I'm just going to tell you how to find that number. It's always gonna be half of this middle terms coefficient squared. So I take half of eight to get four and square it to get 16. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add 16 inside there, right? But remember, you can't just add 16 to an expression and without changing its value, you have to also subtract it. And so I'm gonna subtract the 16 as well here, as you'll see down below. So I'm adding basically zero to the right side. So I'm not changing the value of that expression, but I am gonna change its form because x squared plus eight x plus 16 is x plus four quantity squared. You can check that out just by foiling. All right, and so let's go down here, right? Add it and subtract it the 16. I can factor that guy, right? So that number completed the square that I was trying to find and then the new constant is minus 15. All right, so now we have it in the right form. The coefficient out in front is one. This guy, if you have an x plus four in there, I can always write it as x minus a negative of that guy, right? If you wanna think about what the vertex is. And then the minus 15 is k. All right, so to graph this, I first start with x squared. I move it to the left four units because I'm adding four inside and then I'm shifting it down 15 units. All right, so that's the graph of that guy, but that's equivalent to this function. Okay, so the only real way to graph this guy is to write it in this form and then use our results. All right, next example is, let's see. Oh, okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Here, all I did was I summarized all of the results. So vertical and horizontal translation, reflections and compressions and stretchings, right? So it's all kind of in one place for you. <laughs> all right, so here, go ahead and try this. This one's a little trickier, um, but I'll warn you that uh, ahead of time. Notice here that we do not have a coefficient, or I'm sorry, we, the coefficient of x squared is not one, right? And so to complete the square, I have to somehow find a number that plays the role of a, 
right? And notice on the inside here, the thing being squared, the x has a coefficient of one. And so apparently, if I were to multiply this out and multiply through by a, the coefficient of x squared is a, right? So that tells you I'm gonna need to yank out that minus two, but of what terms is the question, right? So go ahead and try it. Um, and then we'll talk about that when you get back to the video. <laughs> All right, so here's the trick. Um, remember, for completing the square, you don't focus on a constant term if there happens to be one, right? In this case, there isn't, right? There's no extra plus anything or, uh, uh, in terms of a number. They're just an x squared and an x term. Fine. Whatever you do, in order to make the coefficient of x squared one, you have to yank that coefficient out of the x squared and the x terms, right? And so that's what I'm doing here. That's the first step. We didn't need to do that before, right? Because there was no coefficient of x squared, but there is now. So the first step in completing the square, when you have a quadratic whose x squared term has a coefficient other than one, is to yank that coefficient out of the x squared and the x terms. All right, the minute I've done that, now the way you determine this number is exactly the same as what you did in the previous example. You take half the coefficient of x, which is a half, and square it to get a fourth, okay? But now here's the catch. Before what you did is you added a fourth here, so you subtracted a fourth here to balance out that expression to make sure you, you just added zero. The only problem here is if you just add a fourth, technically, and you were to expand this out, you'd find that you're not adding zero in that case. And the reason is you're multiplying what you put in here by this minus two on the outside, all right? And so what you have to do in order to balance out having added this one fourth inside, what you have to do is multiply this coefficient minus two times that a fourth and add its opposite. Right, this is the number you have to add to that side to make sure that you've just added zero. All right, and so once you've done that, I can factor this as a binomial squared. That's by choice. It's always x plus whatever that middle term is, squared, and then plus a half. And then I can, in order to emphasize that the vertex is just hk, I write this as minus a negative, but uh, technically you don't have to if you remember that. Okay, so the vertex is minus one half, one half. That just goes back to our previous observation about the graph of a, a general quadratic. The vertical line through the vertex is x equals minus one half. And so that is the axis of symmetry. <laughs> to find the x-intercepts, remember the x-intercepts are, they occur when the y is zero, right? On the x-axis itself, the y-coordinate is zero. And so what I'll do is I'll set the function equal to zero and I'll solve that for x, right? So I'm gonna yank out the minus two x, right? So, excuse me, solving this quadratic is easiest done by factoring method. So I'm gonna factor out the minus two x and now by the zero factor theorem, set each factor equal to zero and solve for x. So what I know is that this function crosses the x axis at zero and minus one. And just notice that those happen to both be a half unit away from the, the vertex, right? It has to be equidistant from the vertex by the symmetry. All right. um, the graph opens downward because the coefficient of x squared is negative, right? So this negative here would have told you to flip the graph of two times x plus a half squared over the x-axis. And so to flip it over the x-axis, that means that the u is gonna be downward. All right, the range, therefore, starts at the y-coordinate of the vertex and goes to minus infinity. And so you have minus infinity to a half. The domain of any quadratic is all reals. It always is, right? There's no number you can't perform those operations on. And then the graph, um, I only show the end result, but the graph is obtained from here. You first move x squared to the left one-half unit then you compress it towards the y-axis by a factor of two. Then you flip it over the x-axis, and then you move that up one half unit. Right? And that's what's happening here. All right. Okay, for the next example, 
I want to just take a look, just to remind you how to find x-intercepts. It links to solving quadratic equations, right? And so we know that when solving quadratic equations, you have one of three things that can happen. Either you get two distinct real solutions, you can get one repeated real solution, or you can get two complex conjugate solutions, two, two answers that involve I that happen to be conjugates of each other. All right, so let's actually just set each one. We want to find the x-intercepts. We're gonna set each one of these guys equal to zero and just see what happens. Or you could even try that on your own if you want. Um, this won't be surprising. You've already done that before. All right, so if I set the first one equal to zero, the, since it's already in the form of completing the square, the most efficient method here would be the radical method. You could use any of the three, factoring if it factors, radical method if it applies, or quadratic formula, but the most efficient one is the one that takes the least amount of work, right, to get to the answer, right, to in here that's radical method. So I'm going to add the one to both sides, I'm going to divide by four, and then I'm going to take the square root of both sides, don't forget the plus or minus there, and then plus or minus a radical of fourth is really a half, subtract two from both sides, and then simplify. Right, you're subtracting and adding a half to minus two each time to get those guys. So for this one, you have two x-intercepts on either side, one on either side of the vertex. For number two, if you tried to solve this, right, you say, well, there's only a square term, so why don't we just use the radical method, which means you should get the x squared term on one side by itself. Great, yes, I agree. So you get x squared equals minus a third because you subtract the one and divide by three. Problem is, if you now take the square root of both sides, you get a square root of minus one third, which is not real, right? That'll have an imaginary component. And so what that tells you is that the graph of three x squared plus one, so this function, that function will not cross the x-axis, right? Any time you get an imaginary solution when you try to find intercepts of a quadratic function, that means that are, they don't have any. And you can kind of see that just by thinking about what the graph looks like. Start with x squared, right, so you have this. I'm going to compress it towards the y-axis by a factor of three, and then I'm going to move it up one, right? So the lowest point on that curve occurs at the vertex, which is now at zero, one all the other y values are larger than one. And so in particular, there's never a y value of zero at any point on that curve, right? And so it doesn't cross the x-axis. All right, number three, if I, if I set this equal to zero and solve for x, you'll notice that you could in fact factor this guy as two x plus one quantity squared, right? And so you could actually verify that just boiling it out. Um, but what that tells you is you have only one x-intercept, namely at the vertex, negative one-half. And so there's, what that means is that when you were to, if you're looking at this function in, in uh, when you graph it, pardon me, when you graph it, the vertex will live on the x-axis, right? You'll either open up from the vertex or down, but you didn't translate it vertically in either direction, All right? So those are the three cases, just so you know. Um, the biggest one here, of, of importance and possibly kind of that requires a little bit of analysis is the second one, right? Just remember if you have imaginary solutions, those are not points on the curve. That just means that you don't have x-intercepts in that case. All right. The next example, uh, how do you find the points of intersection of two quadratics, right? So the reason we ask this at this point is that eventually when you get into calculus, you're gonna to wanna to look at regions in the plane and of particular interest in forming those regions are the points of intersection, right? You're gonna look at, you know, regions between two parabolas, let's say, and you'll wanna know what their area is. Well, but to do that, you need to find those points of intersection. And so that's really an, a pre-calc and algebra sort of issue. All right, so to find the intersection of two graphs, well, the points of intersection have to be on both graphs. And what that means is you have to solve technically a system of equations, right? That's the only way you're gonna get two points or a point on two graphs simultaneously. <clears throat> so if you think about it, these are both equal to y, 
Remember, just our generic form, the f of x is the y value here, the g of x is the y value there. And so if you think of them as both equal to y, the easiest method to use to solve that system would just be substitution, right? Because you have them both solve for y, just plug one in for y in the other equation. And so that's what we're doing. We're basically setting these two guys equal to each other, right? And then we're solving for x. So if you do that, that's just a quadratic equation. You can solve it using any of the three natural methods that you know about for solving quadratics. And that gives you x equals minus two and two, right? So those are the x coordinates of the points of intersection. If you plug in minus two and two into these functions, you'll get zero each time, right? And so what it tells you is that the points of intersection are minus two, zero and two, zero. I'll let you do your turn three. It's basically the same, only now we have a quadratic and a line, right? But the principle is the same. If you wanna find points of intersection of two functions, you set those functions equal to each other and solve for x, right? So I'll pull up the solution for you to read, um, but pause it and then and do that. Okay, so just note here that I set them equal to each other. That's quadratic. So I'm gonna solve it for x by picking everything to the left side, and then I use the factoring method. Right, so just make sure that you got those answers before going on. Okay, now we've come to example six, one of the most important sort of computations that we're gonna do here, because it's one of the first and foremost important things you'll do in Calc 1, right? And that is computing what's called a difference quotient. Okay, so we have a quadratic, and what I wanna do Outside of context, I don't care what this means yet, right? You'll talk about the connection of this to a graph geometrically and to situations that are physical in nature or whatnot, and that involve rates. You'll do that in calc, right? So that's not my concern at this point. My concern is making certain that you can actually simplify something that looks like this. All right, and so what do you do? This would be a, a dandy time to remember that f of box notation for a function. Right, so um, instead of an x, rewrite the function as f of box, and that equals, on the right side, replace each of the x's by a box. And so you have two minus three times box minus the box squared. And then remember how the function behaves, whatever is in the parentheses each time is what goes into the box each time to compute that. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. All right, and so that's what I'm gonna do over here. If I put x plus h into the box, right, I'm gonna have two minus three times that x plus h, then minus that x plus h squared, right? So this first chunk here is precisely that. And then over here, I'm subtracting f of x. So notice I have parentheses around the f of x. And I'm subtracting the whole thing. And then I have this all thing divided by h. This h down below is the very last thing you're gonna deal with. So don't start canceling anything now. Leave it alone until the very end. All right. Now, what you have to focus on doing is simplifying the numerator. What that entails is distributing this minus three to both those terms. That's what I get here. Distributing this minus one through all three terms and then squaring x plus h here to get that, all right? And then finally, in terms of simplification, we distribute this minus one through those three terms, okay? Now, once you've done all that, in the numerator alone, combine like terms. Again, don't piddle around with this h down here yet, all right? So we'll know there's a two and a negative two, there's a three x and a negative three x, and an x squared and a negative x squared in the top, all those cancel. And the terms that remain are minus 3h, minus 2hx, and minus h squared. Those are the terms that remain in the top, all over h. All right. And so now what I'm gonna do, you cannot just kill this h and that h, right? What you have to do is factor the common factor of h out of all three terms like I did here, right? So I write this as a negative h, that factor times this other stuff, that's over h. You could only cancel like factors in top and bottom, right? You cannot cancel terms. And so you cannot kill this h with just this one, 
right? This H here is a term. You have to cancel only like factors. All right, so here, uh, cancel the H's and then multiply by negative one, and this is your final expression that's equal to this guy, okay? All right, try your turn four, exactly the same idea. You wanna simplify it algebraically using the same basic steps that I did here. See what you got. All right, so let's see if you got the right initial. This was, if you're gonna have issues very often, this is the first place you're gonna have them in, in the very first step. All right, so f of x plus h, I'm plugging in the x plus h directly for that x each time. So think of it using our box notation. The box is squared here, so I'm gonna square the x plus h. And then I have minus three times the box, minus three times the x plus h. And then from that, I'm gonna subtract f of x, which is here. Don't forget the parentheses. Right. Now to simplify the top, I need to square this guy, right? That's what I do here. And then I'm gonna do all of my substitution, or uh, it's not, not substitutions, distributed distributions. Uh, take the four through there, the minus three through all terms there, and the minus one there. That's what I do in the, in the top. Notice I'm not touching this H down below yet. And then I'm gonna add like terms in the top. That means I'm gonna get rid of the three X and the four X squared. And that's gonna leave me with these three terms. But remember, you cannot cancel out this H and that H. It's, you just cannot do that. You have got to factor an H out, like I did here, and then cancel that factor of an H in top and bottom, okay? So make sure you practice this. It's more, it's in the homework again, of course, um, but make sure that you practice that sort, of op that sort of computation because it's gonna be very important in Calc 1. All right, and then I'll let you read this example. Again, it's a word problem. Um, it's better you actually read through this and try a problem and then ask, I think, rather than me trying to walk you through it. So take, Take some time and walk through this on your own and see what you can get. All right. And then once you're done, try the homework problems at the end of the section in the book that that's on your schedule grid. Depending on what class you're in, again, don't worry about this 3.4 here. I'm using the same notes, uh, same book for three classes, but it's in different orders and that sort of thing. So just make sure you check the schedule grid um, to see what section of the PDF these problems are actually in. Let me know how it goes.